Plato's student, Aristotle, was both his mentor's greatest disciple and his most incisive critic. Born in 384 BC in the small city of Stagira, Aristotle was undoubtedly one of the most wide-ranging and influential philosophers in history. He had a keenly scientific mind and wrote seminal works in politics, ethics, and metaphysics, as well as science. He was also the private tutor to the young Alexander the Great and invented the formal system of logic that was used for two millennia after his death. One could think of Plato as the distant, amazing genius. Aristotle is the man who's good at absolutely everything he does, as far as I can tell, which makes him extraordinarily admirable and also a little frightening to me. Uh, he was good at everything. He established the science of logic. He established a science of biology. Uh, he wrote the first treatise of literary criticism that we have. He has the first political theory in a form that maybe people will recognize the political theory today. Of course, Plato has a political theory too, but Aristotle writes treatises rather than dialogues. He invents, so to speak, the style in which philosophical discourse operates uh, since then. He has an amazing view of the whole universe, which was extremely influential for uh, thousands of years. While Aristotle initially embraced the doctrine of the forms, he later criticized this notion, asserting that Plato's ideas were mere abstractions. For Aristotle, individual and particular things are the only concrete reality, what he called substance. Reality is the here and now, not an intellectualized abstraction. Aristotle closely observed the life cycle of living creatures and noted that organisms are characterized by perpetual movement and change. Birth is the passage from not being into being. Growth is the transformation from one state of being into another. And death signifies the return from being back into non-being. Aristotle states that in everything there is a substratum that changes and moves and constitutes the material basis of that thing. A person's substratum is flesh and bone, and that of a statue is marble. Aristotle identified two conditions for the existence and evolution of an individual, matter and form. Form is the propelling, organizing, and final principle of change. The form of a statue is the artist's vision, which gives shape to the substratum. Form and matter, then, are the two factors involved in the process of becoming. Generally, things which come to be, come to be in different ways. One, by change of shape, as a statue. Two, by addition, as things which grow. Three, by taking away, as the Hermes from the stone. Four, by putting together, as a house. Five, by alteration, as things which turn in respect of their material substance. It is plain that these are all cases of coming to be from a substratum. Aristotle saw change as a tension between actuality and potentiality. Potentiality refers to that which isn't, but by means of evolving will come to be. Actuality refers to that which is. An acorn is, in its actuality, a seed. But in potentiality, it is a tree. In Aristotle's conception, the actual takes precedence over the potential, for there can be no movement from potential to actual without there being something actual in the first place. This view naturally leads to the question of why change happens 
which in turn leads to the notion of causality. Aristotle identified four kinds of causes. The material, the formal, the efficient, and the final. Each cause answers one of the four questions we can ask about a thing. What is it? What is it made of? By what is it made? And finally, for what end is it made? One thing may have many causes. For instance, the material cause of a desk may be wood, while its efficient cause is a carpenter. For the idea of potentiality to make sense, Aristotle had to assume the existence of a pure actuality that existed at a level above the potential. Aristotle called this pure actuality the unmoved mover. It is unmoved because movement implies change and therefore imperfection. The unmoved mover is pure thought, whose only activity is to think itself, and in so doing provides an ideal for human beings to imitate, the contemplative life. For both thinking and the act of thought will belong even to one who thinks of the worst thing in the world, so that if this ought to be avoided, and it ought, for there are even some things which it is better not to see than to see, the act of thinking cannot be the best of things. Therefore, it must be of itself that the divine thought thinks, since it is the most excellent of things, and its thinking is a thinking on thinking. Aristotle identified the soul as the animating principle that differentiates living things from non-living things. Body and soul are not two parts of one creature, however. The body is simply its matter, and the soul its form. Aristotle declared that asking whether a soul can exist without a body is as meaningless as asking whether the wax and the shape given to it by the stamp are one. The soul is the final cause of the body and can be one of three types, corresponding to three ways of being available to a living thing. The vegetative soul enables the act of living the sensitive soul, the act of living and sensing, and the rational soul, the act of living, sensing, and thinking. Aristotle paid particular attention to the structure of valid reasoning. The Greek word for reasoning or meaning is logos, and his reflections on the structure of reason gave birth to the discipline of logic, one of the major branches of philosophy. He identified the syllogism as a special kind of argument consisting of three parts, a major premise, a minor premise, and a conclusion. The classic example of a syllogism is, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. Aristotelian logic would dominate the field for 2,000 years. Aristotle also took aim at Zeno's paradox and in his rebuttal came up with a conception of infinity that is still taught in schools today. Aristotle's idea is that there is infinity all right, but infinity is not a more than finite number of anything. No, to talk of infinity is to talk of an ever expandable finitude. In his view, there is an infinite number of half distances between here and the door, only in a restricted sense, that however large a number, however large a finite number of distances you have marked out in your thought, or, or even by some physical marking, you can always mark out a larger finite number. This finitude is ever expandable, but it always remains a finitude. And so we are not required 
to cross a more than finite number of distances. Aristotle believes that uh, uh, human beings are generally endowed with the abilities uh, to understand the world around them more or less completely. Some, of course, are better at it than others, but where Plato would see people as divided in different classes according to their abilities, Aristotle uh, thinks it's only a matter of degree rather than a matter almost of the kind of person uh, you are. Uh, his physics, his astronomy, everywhere you look, Aristotle will have something to say. In a very serious way, it's Aristotle who has the greatest influence on the development and the intellectual development of the West. We have no evidence as yet about mind or the power to think. It seems to be a widely different kind of soul, different as what is eternal from what is perishable. It alone is capable of existence in isolation from all other psychic powers.